So one of my favorite people standing by, Bridget Gaynor, Cook County Board, and all the other good things she does in life. Good morning to you, Bridget. Good morning. Was that my walk-on song? It was kind of your walk-on song. How do you feel song. about that? Yeah. Was that okay? I, 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 I'm okay with it. I'm yeah, going to okay. take it. It wasn't bad. Well, Bridget, that was your sister. Oh! <laughs> Gloria Gaynor. Gloria Gaynor. <laughs> Gloria Gaynor. <laughs> Bridget Gaynor. Yeah. How would I ever doubt our band? Oh. Oh. Spelled my name wrong. Oh, Gloria Gaynor, well, yeah. it's a stretch. Listen, we can't get it all right. At least it wasn't. At least no one brought up Mitzi Gaynor because that that really you know puts the puts the ears on. You know what? That would date you, and I know you'd never do that. <laughs> uh, all right, Bridget Gaynor, uh, you just brought something off the air, which I think is important to say on the air um, with your job at Aon. You do travel the world at various times, yeah. and you get a chance to get some perspective on things. We get a lot of bad news because yeah. bad news is news. And certainly there are a million problems to be fixed. But tell everybody what you told me out there a second ago. Yeah, so I was in Nairobi. I, you know, I co-lead the climate strategy for AM. It was a climate conference in Kenya. Went out there. And damn, you know, you're there and there's no curves on the sidewalks. And I mean, it's a great city and they're doing great things and all that stuff. But it does make you realize how incredibly organized and well-run things are in the United States. As much as we may feel it's going badly and for one reason or another um you know things work and i really appreciated it and the 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 initial Mm -hmm. piece of that perspective that i just got in the moment from the comment that you made is not only is there perspective that you still live in the greatest country in the world but there's also a perspective of let's not let a slide continue that we can stop in any number of areas absolutely well as we were just talking about with my various um injuries in this last year (laughs) You got to you got to nip that stuff in the bud. Yep. Cuz you know, it's not yep. good. And be aggressive about it. I uh, had the good fortune yesterday of, of uh, joining our friend Andrea Darlis and we played at one of the mm-hmm. Chicago Police Department uh, golf outings and hanging out with cops all day. And that'll make you feel better. Um uh, yeah, well, it's usually sunny and 70 the whole time. Well, there was so. that part, too. <laughs> um, but having said that, we still have this tremendous shortage of uh, actual bodies on the street in Chicago. You hear yeah. things we don't hear. Is there talk of this um, that uh, they're going to find a way to find people to fill those jobs? Because part of the problem, of course, is the lack of being able to recruit people. But are we going to put an emphasis on putting more cops out? Do you know anything in that regard? I don't know anything differently, and obviously Snelling is just going to be confirmed in the next couple of days at City Council, and so, you know, he'll be running the police department, and then he'll have the ability to make those decisions. The thing I feel better about is that we're getting someone who knows our city, but also knows the police department, has spent his lifetime of his career there, and he, he's not going to be on a learning curve when he gets there, and he's been hearing for years, um, he's been hearing for years how... Uh, this isn't working what needs to be done. So my hope is that he can address that in some way. So I hope he can get in there, but I haven't heard any other big moves on how that's going to change. So the thing about, and, and you know, you're not here to talk law uh, strategy and, and uh, fighting the bad guys, but basic human behavior. I mean, you've got kids who are college age kids and we see what happened at DePaul in the last week mm-hmm. and at Loyola, the way you stop or change a human behavior is to make that human behavior no longer rewarding Mm. and to make the campuses a place where you are going to get arrested or you are going to be stopped seems like the way to go. And these campus, uh, um, you know, f- um, uh, security forces, they don't have the bodies to do it, apparently. Well, no. I mean, a college security force is not there for that. They're, they're, that's not their job is to arrest violent criminals. Um, they're not trained to do that, and they probably shouldn't. Um, they, they, if anything, they can interrupt bad things when they're happening. But, you know, I think two things are happening at the same time. You see an increase in the reporting of these incidents. And sometimes I wonder, I'm like, is it because everyone has a camera now that we can just see this stuff in real time and it Mm -hmm. feels so much more visceral um, and real? But there is a clear, that's not just it. I mean, there is a clear uptick, especially when it comes to robberies and carjackings in the last couple of years. And now the question is, um, you know, and I put that way more at the feet of behavior change that happened during the pandemic. Yeah, we we obviously have to make it pay and the punishment needs to follow it. But I feel like from a social norms perspective, we went in a different direction in the pandemic. And and I don't know how we get back there. Obviously, punishment is a, is a part of it, but it's not the only part of it. Um, but I, I think that, that that break in what was acceptable 
uh, happened, and we haven't found our way back. Well, you make an interesting point because the breaking what's acceptable in behavior and, and speech from our leaders and also what's acceptable from people getting yeah, down to obviously. a simple crime like yeah. shoplifting. But then also the mental being health able to tsunami grab came from the pandemic too, the behaviors. It, it definitely exacerbated. And I feel like all of a sudden it was like, do whatever you want. And, and I don't know if it was because there was no sanction or it was because like, who cares? Life sucks anyway. Look, I I mean, I think you have to be more omniscient than me to determine what gets into people's heads and why they do things. But the those crimes make people feel like, you know, things aren't under control. Now, having said that, I've lived here my entire life. Um, I've never been involved in anything like that. Nor candidly has has anyone I've known. And so we we see it and we hear it all the time. The question is, do you feel safer otherwise because of your own experience or because what? getting reported. But I have to say, I am looking forward to, I think we've had, you know, I don't think the last police superintendent did us any favors and I'm confident that we're going to be in better hands. Um, but he's only one part of the equation. There's the state's attorney's race that's coming down the pike uh, next year. And it'll be interesting to listen to how those two talk about, are they going to keep the, are they going to keep the regulations and the, the kind of the, the charging requirements that Kim Fox put in, will they change? Will they go back to the way it was before? Will there be a heavy medium? How does it work with the state law? So, you know, all these guys work as different legs of the table, but you've got two big changes. You've got new mayor, a new police commissioner, and you're going to have a new state's attorney all within a year. I want to revisit the mayor in a second, but first. Yeah, uh, yeah and we want to revisit uh, that we want to talk about the land bank as well, because that's some good news okay. there. But Bridget, yeah. I want to ask you quickly your thoughts on the newly signed deal with Garda World for the base camp construction that's happening here in, in six different areas of Chicago to house the migrants. Do you think that was the too soon to make that deal or, or should they have thought about it longer or is that the right thing? Well, look, you, you got to move and do something. I, I can't, every time I see a photo of uh, or talk to a police officer and these guys are living in the lobby, it's unconscionable. It's ridiculous. Because, hey, it's terrible for them and it's terrible for the police officers. Imagine if you showed up at work every day and people were living there. It's really, you know, that's that's terrible for everyone involved. And so something had to happen. The question is, do you, do you build tents or do you try to redeploy existing buildings? I, I don't know. I mean... I know that the the Catholic Church has tried multiple times to try to offer buildings to use. It's it's been kind of really hard to get through the eye of the needle about what's acceptable to the city. Um, and Catholic Charities is doing a lot, but they you know there has to be a public response. I think you have to move. You have to make a decision whether that was the right one and the and what they're paying for it is the question. The other thing is all of this stuff needs to be. Um, publicly disclosed about what we're paying because there's no reason that we shouldn't understand what's in there. Um, so I always get, I, it's suspect when someone's like, you don't need to see all the details. And you're like, you well, know. yeah. And, and the, 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 the word transparency has no meaning anymore when it comes out of any politician's mouth, right or left. Assuming Bridget Ganner stayed on hold, she rejoins us now. Um, all right. Uh, the mayor, He's not saying much, and when he is saying things, it's kind of a word salad. You've known Brandon Johnson for a long time. Concerned? Give him time. Where are you at with this? Um, you know, somewhere in between those two things. You know, obviously appointing the police commissioner was the most important thing. The, there's going to be stability at the leadership. You know, Pedro Martinez is going to stay at the school. So those are the two biggest roles. There's others like planning commissioner housing and health that are that need to be filled that are not filled. And so that's obviously a concern. Um, I think that he is thoughtful and methodical and he's taking his time to do things in the right way. Um, and it's always good to remember, like the head has gone, but there's tons of obviously people within each of those departments that have been working for years. And so, you know, know, know the, the role really well. So I'm not, there's, there's no reason to panic right now. Um, I think he's trying to focus the migrant crisis in his defense. I mean, Jesus, that came out of, Nowhere, and it has ratcheted itself up, and he's dealing with that to stabilize. So I think that that's probably sucking up a lot of the oxygen in the room. I just wish but that he—I've yeah. he, met his people and his and the people yeah. around him. They're all terrifically nice folks. I don't yeah. know that they're good at their jobs. 
And I wish he would do things like obviously come in here and answer fair questions um, or at least have his team return the calls. Uh, But second to that, um, I wish that he would speak up more for the city I know he clearly loves as opposed to falling into what sounds like cliches because I think he does himself a disservice. But to go back to the the migrant question and the homeless question in the city, um, is it you, you talked about how tough it is for Catholic charities to repurpose buildings. Is it city red tape that keeps this from happening? Because the idea that we would put up a tent city, not just because yeah. of the bad idea and the cold weather and the safety. Yeah. This city has enough of an image problem without allowing network news camera drones to fly over and go, now Chicago's yeah. a tent city. Yeah. So is it is it red tape in the city that allows us or keeps us from, from taking these buildings and doing something with them? Look, I... I will make this comment, which has nothing to do with Brandon, because it's been a 30 years in the making. Right. And it, I have lived it for the last 10 years with the land bank. The, uh, the inability of the city to get out of its own way when it comes to the most basic things of, of development of vacant property and land and repurposing is epic proportions. I mean, you know, there's this issue of, and you might have heard this in the news, like, Someone someone didn't pay their water bill. They moved away. Ten years later, no one can redevelop that parcel until you pay the seven thousand dollar water bill. And nobody and everyone's like, Well, God, I wish there was something I could do. There is. You could you could move on because it they would rather I think part of it is nobody wants a bad story. Nobody wants to say that they made a decision that had any sort of um risk involved and so they do nothing. And the whether it's I think it's a combination of the law department the and planning and building, and there's just an inability to move. And it's hostage by bureaucrats mm-hmm. who would rather do nothing because then you don't get in trouble. That is something that I have zero time for because it doesn't just stop redevelopment and tax base and, you know, making sure that someone doesn't need to live next to a vacant house. In this case, it also stymies creativity, and there's no excuse for it, none. Bridget, that, that's something I feel really strongly about. No, Jane, what do you want to know about the land bank? Well, I mean, you're doing great things there with the Cook County Land Bank. So let's talk about how you're yeah. spurring all this community development. You know, it, it's look, the, the land bank in many ways exists because the city was impossible to work with. And it's kind of ludicrous that out of a county board office, you'd have a social enterprise that's now done 2,000 units of housing. Wow. Um, but it's because... People want to live in these communities. Every single neighborhood has people who are dying to live there because they grew up there or their families around there. But you literally cannot get housing, whether it's back taxes or it's owned by the city, out of this swamp. But we figured out a way. We have a mini law firm that clears tax. There's a woman named Jessica Caffrey. She's running the land bank now. She's phenomenal. Long real estate background. And it's just like methodical. You know, you go in. You find the property, you get it out of the tax sale, you clear the tax, you clear the title, and you put it out there. You find a a local person to develop it. And, you know, one of the things one was proud of, in addition to there's 2,000 properties that used to be vacant that now someone lives there and pays taxes, it's also that, you know, if you look at the difference between what we sold the property to a developer for, 5,000, 10,000, whatever it was, and what they sold it out into the community for, which is usually 200,000 or something that's housing, you know, sometimes way more depending on where it is. That's $184 million if you add it across all the properties that we call community wealth because everything we do, 90% of it is for home ownership. And so you've got some local developer doing it and building their business. You've got someone owning a house and building equity. And it's that stuff little by little. So look, there's a, like we always know, there's a ton of really good things going on. I just met with a block in Inglewood at 55th and Aberdeen. And, you know, there's four people on that block who want to buy the two vacant lots and rehab a build. You know, they want to come together and do it as a collective. Um, and they've been trying for two years to get the vacant lots of the city. Can't get them. And so we're trying to figure out a way to do it with them. But there's a ton of energy for that all over the city. So, so whenever I get down, those are the things that, that bring me up. Well, you know, Pastor Corey Brooks, a uh, friend of the show, um, and mm-hmm. and the Opportunity Center that he's building um, and Fantastic. giving kids an opportunity yeah. mm-hmm. to make the yeah. right choice, not the wrong choice, is also another example of one of the good stories happening. Yeah, well, let me throw one more in there. So I, I know I th- I've talked about Father Dave Kelly and Precious Blood Ministry of Reconciliation mm-hmm. at over 51st and, and Elizabeth, like mm-hmm. 51st and Racine. Mm-hmm. You know, we... Gave, sold them a house from the land bank eight or nine years ago. They had young people rehab it, and now they're on their fourth house. 
And his, you know, they are just, you know, making a big move now to lean into housing. So we're trying to work with them to think, how could we assemble enough houses where you really give people a shot for home ownership, whether that's a co-op or, you know, some sort of collective ownership structure. But there's a lot of creative people out there um, doing interesting things. And I mean, this is why faith is so important because you get these committed leaders out there who are deeply engaged in their community and they're there for the long term. And, and there's incredible things. So if anyone is interested in helping make good things happen, Corey Brooks or Father Kelly at, uh, at Precious Blood, they're both doing amazing things. Really are. And uh, I think that is a solid Catholic closer for a nice Catholic girl yeah. like you. And it's always good to end on a positive, happy, let's all do something together note. Yeah. Now, do something good. Now, I would not know this, not being a Catholic mm-hmm. and I'm a believer, and yeah. I, I go to church a lot, yeah. <clears throat> pray every day, but I don't know who the patron saint is for sore necks. Is there one? <laughs> <laughs> well, I hope I hope it's not Job, which is like hopeless, or Jude, which is hopeless causes. So I, okay. hope, I hope it's not there. <laughs> right. We're somewhere in between, but there's, I'm going to get on that. There's probably there's a Wikipedia page. Myself. Yeah. <laughs> there, I'm sure there is. All right, next time you're feeling better, come over. Oh, wait. All right. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Thanks Bridget. Bridget. Bridget Gaynor <laughs> from the Cook County Board. Doesn't everybody have a sore neck? A sore neck? Yeah. Uh, you know, you sleep funny, and then all day long, you're like looking to the left, and you're walking to the right. It's a problem. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Think about it. You get a sore neck.